Hello, I'm James Dilley of Ancient Craft. Today I'm going to be showing you how fire is made. Now when you conjure up an image of people making fire in prehistory, you might have images of people leaning over sticks, perhaps with a bow in their hand, working really hard with smoke appearing all around them. Well, that's one way of making fire by friction, but I'm going to show you a different way of making fire in prehistory that we have lots of evidence for. People in the past would have had to have used rocks like this. Now this may look like a fairly unassuming brown rock, but if I open it up, you can see inside that actually it's something a little bit special. And the likelihood is that you've come across a rock like this before, either in the ground or perhaps in a museum or rock gift shop. This is iron pyrites, and this particular kind of iron pyrites is known as marcasite. Marcasite is great for what I'm intending to use it for because it's pretty unstable. The chemical bond between the iron and sulphur means that if I strike it in the right way, small flecks of iron will detach from the face and through an exothermic reaction, it will generate heat that will cause a spark. Iron pyrites like this does occur naturally in the ground and usually, certainly in Britain, you'll find it in chalky areas. You can find it as small pieces or really large pieces, but not all of it is golden on the inside when you break it open. You can perhaps see on this piece where you can see some more of that natural iron from around the outside. That's where the sulfur and iron is starting to degrade. And that may be where it's been in contact with water, which can accelerate the process. So you lose that golden effect. At that point, it's quite hard to get sparks from it. So I've picked it up at a good time. I'll need a little bit more than this though to start a fire. I'll need some fungus and this is one way of starting that fire to actually catch the spark coming off it to create an ember. These brown stone looking objects are more commonly known as King Alfred's cakes. Its Latin name is Daldinia concentrica and you can find it grown on the outside of trees. Best used when dry. Another fungus that you can find on the outside of trees, particularly birch trees, and again best used when dry, is this orange fungus, which is commonly known as chaga mushroom or chaga fungus. The Latin name of this one is Inonotus obliquus. It's considered one of the best natural tinders out there. You don't need to do any extra processing to it. You can use it straight away, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I've got my iron pyrites and my fungus. I'm going to need a sharp stone blade of some kind, something like this flint blade. Now flint's really good because it has a crypto crystalline structure. That means it has a very, very fine grained microscopic crystalline structure to it. So it's nice and hard, glassy, predictable, easy to work and nap. And I'm gonna use this to strike against the surface to detach my sparks. To help catch that ember in the fungus, I'm gonna need my thick leather pad, of course that chaga fungus, and I'm going to need my iron pyrites ready with a flint blade. You might be wondering what our earliest evidence is of people making fire with iron pyrites. Well, now we have recent evidence that suggests it wasn't just modern humans like us who were making fire using iron pyrites, it was actually our Neanderthal cousins. Not by finding the iron pyrites pieces themselves, but actually looking at their stone tools and looking at the edges where small flecks of iron pyrites were found on a significant number of their tools from at least 50,000 years ago. Now that suggests that they were creating fire not just haphazardly or coming upon it, they were producing fire on demand. So I'll get myself into position, find a good surface, do this on, that's a nice fluffy surface there. Let's see if I can get some sparks off this. Now this is a fresh piece of iron pyrites, so it might take a couple of goes to find the best surface or the best angle. I can certainly see a spark, couple of sparks coming off it. Clear that dust off. There we 
here. You can see a tiny ember has caught. So I don't need to do anything to it now. I can put my tools to the side. A fire triangle needs fuel, the air around it, and some heat, and I've given it that heat source. You can see if I waft it every so often, a little bit of that uh, ember glowing as it gets larger and hotter. So I'll see if I can break this, or even cut it. I don't need to use all of this fungus for that. And these bits can be used another time. So that's burning nicely now. The next thing for me to do is to take some dry grass and put the ember in the grass. So I'll gently tip it in. Try and close it up. Start to blow on it. had quite a lot of rain at the moment so I can tell you trying to find some dry grass was quite a challenge. There we go. Now I refer back to that fire making kit from earlier from that image of people using friction fire. Of course I mainly use stone and stone generally lasts really well in archaeology whereas a friction by fire kit is almost entirely made of wood and of course wood doesn't tend to survive in the ground particularly well but there's another thing to consider as well that once you've finished with your fire lighting kit and you've run out of space on that base plate or the bow snaps or the drills too short well, I'm sure you can imagine, like me, where that spent kit might end up, straight on the fire. And that's really why we have next to no archaeological evidence, certainly in Europe, of a prehistoric friction by fire kit. Whereas we have plenty of evidence of these being used, both actual pieces of marker site with striations across them at sites like Star Car in Yorkshire on the or on the remains of stone tools and even this flint blade that I've used now will have those pieces of iron parietes across the blade. Clearly being able to make fire on demand has its advantages. You can carry around a small portable kit like this and create fire when you get to a campsite or a shelter. You don't necessarily have to carry around an ember, although we know people did that as well. Ertzi the Iceman, the uh, Chalcolithic mummy found in the Italian Alps in 1991, was both carrying a fire kit with him, uh, besides the iron parietes, um, which was presumed missing, although there were remains of striking iron parietes on some of his stone tools, was actually carrying a burning ember in one of his birch bark containers. Clearly for our ancestors who uh, almost certainly would have spent a huge amount of time sitting around a fire, cooking and uh, repairing or making kit around it, it would have been a very important part of their daily lives from gathering firewood to tending the fire um, or preparing it. And no doubt there would have been some quite skilled people who were uh, far more efficient at it than me. And certainly from a very, very early part of our prehistory, people would have been not just scavenging and eating raw meat, they would have been able to cook it, which completely changes the way that humans evolve. Now certainly if you want to try this yourself uh, at home in, of course, an outdoor environment, um, in nearby woodland, for example, as you can see here, the ground has been cleared here, um, it's just soil around it, 
do make sure you do that and have some source of uh, extinguishing uh, a fire if it becomes out of control. It's always really important. And certainly if you're doing it in an outdoor area that has fragile soil um, underneath it, uh, peat for example, that's really something um, to avoid. Uh, I'm on chalk at the moment, so that's not gonna catch a light. Hope you've enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.